Welcome to Stitchery Stories, where textile artists share their life in fabric and thread. Inspiration, techniques, disasters and delights. And I'm Susan Weeks, enthusiastic embroiderer and textile art dabbler who also loves podcasting. So take a break and enjoy our light-hearted chat and please share with your friends so they can enjoy it too. Hello and welcome to our lovely guest today, Julia Tristan. Hi, Julia. Hi, Sue. Hi, it's good to meet you. Now, Julia is a professional artist, designer, maker, educator and author in stitched textiles and contemporary art and design techniques. Julia has always had a passion for stitching and creating art from cloth, threads and recycled things and sold her first upcycled designs whilst in her teens. She is self-employed and has worked in the arts and creative industries for almost 30 years, teaching, lecturing, writing, designing, making, exhibiting and selling her textile artwork. Julia exhibits her work and teaches both nationally and internationally and is a member of the prestigious Textile Study Group. Julia runs her own teaching programme, delivering workshops and courses around the country and she teaches for Stitch Business, a leading independent stitch school based in Durham City. Julia also works on community art projects in schools and museums and undertakes private and public commissions and consultancy work. Her work has been filmed by the BBC, Sky Arts, the Press Association, independent TV and film companies and following her hour on the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square, she features in Anthony Gormley's book One and Other. She has co-written two popular books, both published by Batsford, How to be Creative in Textile Art and Contemporary Applique. Julia enjoys passing on what she's learned about textiles and remains committed to enriching students by inspiring them to express themselves imaginatively through creative, artistic and personal exploration. Oh, there you are. You're very busy, aren't you, Julia? <laughs> I am, I am. <laughs> right, so before we get started with your stitchery story today, would you like to share with us, please, what you are working on and what has got you excited? This year, I've been very excited to take part in the Disrupt exhibition, which is a touring exhibition with the Textile Study Group. Oh. I did a couple of pieces of work for that exhibition, first exhibited in Stroud in May, right. and it's going to Oldham later this year and a couple of other venues next year. The Disrupt exhibition is issue-based work that we've all produced, new pieces for this exhibition, and mine Why I was quite excited about that is that it's my most autobiographical piece of work to date Mm. about text. And what I really want to do is continue that theme, working more autobiographically. So that's been an exciting event this year. Yes, I'm sure it has been. Yeah, very good. At the moment, though, I'm not doing a lot of my own stitching. Mm. I'm preoccupied with a lot of teaching, as so many of us are, running my own workshops. And also I've been busy with City and Guilds teaching at Stitch Business, which I is a the independent stitch school that you mentioned before yes. that I've run with Tracy Franklin. Yes, and of course Tracy was one of my early guests. So yes, um, yeah, so that's a, a good collaboration between the two of you there. Yes. And also I've been doing some freelance writing for an international textile syllabus in art and design, which has been quite exciting. Oh, yes, I should imagine it is. Oh, that's a lot of projects on the go then. As you say, sadly, not much stitching. Not at the moment, but I need to get back to that. I think I spend, like a lot of us, teaching and doing a lot of admin at the moment, Mm. online tutorials and keeping up to date with um, updating handouts. All the admin that is involved in running a business or being self-employed, unfortunately, you have to do all that stuff. Well, yes, that's right. And it does take us away from stitching. And and I know that all too well at the moment. Uh, My stitching output has been fairly minimal for the last couple of months. Most of my spare ha-ha time goes on doing this now yeah. so um yes yeah. so I spend a lot of time talking about stitching <laughs> but yeah but I think sometimes you don't have to underestimate that talking and thinking time I think that can be very mm. important so I am actually thinking about my next pieces of work and I need to just get back into my studio I've got a half term next week so I should have a little bit more time and hopefully get back in the studio and uh, get some stitching done soon Oh, right. Yes. Well, we've got actually we've got half term in two two weeks. We mm-hmm. don't break till the 27th. So then, of course, everything grinds to a halt for me because I've got my son at home. So yeah. um, trying to get any work done then is quite, <clears throat> quite a challenge. OK, so yes, yeah, so that's quite a few exciting projects there, as you say. Now, in your bio there, 
you've been involved in, in textile art and so on for, as you say, a number of years. So how did you first get involved um, and get interested in embroidery and textile art, Julia? Who taught you? What sort of things did you do? I think, again, like many of us who work in textiles, I was very, very young when I first picked up fabric and mm a needle to stitch with it was my nan who was the biggest influence originally on my life in as far as textiles go she taught me to sew she was a dressmaker she made a lot of our own clothes when we were children Mm. she made wedding dresses from her on her dining room table (laughs) Um, and she made lots of bridesmaids dresses I mean she yeah she made and she had a sewing machine permanently up in her living room really yes my mom made quite a few of our clothes when we were young so there was always scraps of fabric around that I used to play with and want to stitch together and I think I first started making things for my dolls that was the first thing that I started making. <laughs> oh, yes because I was making dolls clothes and dolls yeah clothes and soft toys the very very first thing that I made and I do still have it somewhere, is a tiny little chick made out of mustard crimpling <laughs> with very frayed now velvet orange beak and cheeks um, <laughs> and little webbed feet that hang off the bottom of this. Uh, <laughs> with, with this thing. And I think the eyes and the mouth and bits and pieces around the additions of applique, bits of velvet orange, uh, um, scribbled in felt tip pen. That's the first thing that I remember making, and I do know that I still have that somewhere. I I just loved making. I loved working with my hands. I loved being busy with my hands. In my teenage years, I got more seriously into dressmaking and started designing a lot of my own clothes. Mm. I sold quite a few of my own creations to my friends. And probably from about the age of 12, my mum's sewing machine was a permanent fixture in my own bedroom. <laughs> yes. I was always making, making presents. And it, I think... I went away for it for quite some time because I did a business degree, so I left it behind. But in my spare time, I would continue to make things like curtains for my home or the odd skirt or whatever it may have been. And I did my business degree, but I've always then gone back to textiles and to making. So I think it's been a permanent passion for quite some time. It's always been in the background and sometimes it's been more prominent in my life. And obviously now it has been my business and I've been self-employed doing this for almost 23 years. Yeah, oh, that's brilliant. Yes, I well, I actually did a business studies degree as well. And mm. same story, basically, I was always making things and fiddling around with bits of material. And you know, we used to get these really fantastic patterns, I think, mum still gets it woman's weekly there was always mm. stuffed toys and there was always really interesting things to make in there and of course we never had all the in- like the ingredients all the things that you needed so you had to improvise didn't you a great deal yes, you did. yes. Try, trying to fit clothes on things like pippa dolls and mm. mine was a punk because i cut her hair off she got annoyed <laughs> with it one day various things it was oh dear but yeah was, when i was a student I made a few bits and pieces. I did some some embroidery, some two kind of fairly classic 1920s, I think they are, garden scenes, you know, with all mm. the different um, stitches. I used to do that kind of hide in my room and pretend I wasn't doing embroidery. <laughs> and then I think we had this fancy ball when we all graduated. And I, did, I was determined I wasn't going to be uh, overdrawn. Mm. So I thought, right, I'm going to make my ball dress. So I found this absolutely bonkers pattern and went to a shop I think it was in North Shields or somewhere I was up in Newcastle yeah. and it was Mr Men curtain fabric <laughs> it was fab with like loads of bright pink and things on it and so I made this completely mental dress which had kind of had pink ribbon laced up the back it was very short like a tutu That's with great. this pink pink net underskirt on it and turned up at this ball where everybody else had gone and bought the Laura Ashley ball dresses and things you know yeah. <laughs> like, what the hell have you got on oh well I'd rushed it up in a couple of days oh dearie me yeah it was um i've still got definitely got pictures of that it got ruined though sadly my ex-husband decided to wear it at a vicar and tarts party yeah. and he was a bit larger than me so it didn't survive the evening yeah. but never mind. what would you say from those very creative roots what were, what have been major inspirations to you over the years julia and also particularly currently if they've changed Yeah, I think obviously my nan, who I mentioned before, Mm. was a great inspiration to me. She was such a strong woman and doing that under quite difficult circumstances in in some ways. 
As far as when I got into textiles a bit more seriously after doing my sitting guilds and then looking forwards to see where I could take my textile work and start exhibiting on the national scene rather than just locally, mm. I have to um, cite Julia Caprara. She was a great mentor to me. She was very, very encouraging and very supportive of the work that I was doing after I attended a couple of workshops with her. She invited right. me to join her masterclass in PRISM. And I was a member of PRISM for many, many years. Nice. And it was through her that I was able to launch my work and myself onto the national scene, really, in the textile art world. And she was great. And I still miss her today. She mm. was very, very inspirational to me. In more recent years, I have completed an MA in Contemporary Applied Arts that I did over at the University of Cumbria. Yeah. And during that time, I became very inspired by a lot of Japanese designers, fashion designers. Yeah in particular Junya Watanabe and Rei Kawakubu. And I really like their collaboration of Comme de Garçon clothes, the way they deconstruct and reconstruct textiles to bring an element that wasn't seen in clothing before about the 1980s. Their work was quite controversial when it first appeared mm. on the catwalks in Paris, but continues to be quite cutting edge even today. And that inspired me greatly in some of the garments that I got back into because I think after working in dressmaking and making a lot of three-dimensional clothing and wearable pieces even in my own creations in my teenage years yeah. I went back to doing a lot of two-dimensional work so going back to three-dimensional work and rediscovering the art of that in about 2008, 9, 10, 11 in particular when I was doing some work for an exhibition making my bra rah, dresses and doing my MA I got very much back into fashion, funk top fashion, upcycled garments and creating my own designs again. So those Japanese designers were very inspirational for that reason. Um, other artists who have influenced me, people like Gaudi, the way he brings lots of elements together in quite quirky ways. Yes, yes, very and quirky. I have always seen the materials that I work with as different ingredients and bringing different ingredients together in different quantities, in different ways, picking out the landmarks in some of my raw materials that I really like to work with and bringing those together. And I think there's lots of artists that you can look at in so many different ways, uh, whether it's a three-dimensional installation perhaps done by somebody like Cornelia Parker, that can still influence your textile work. Yes, a painting by Hundert Vasa or whoever it might be. I think we are sponges and we like looking and we get our influences from so many different areas and so many different people. I was in Mexico a few years ago and I had the honour and pleasure to go to the Blue House where Frida Kahlo lived. Oh, yes. Um, oh, that was good. It was fantastic. Yeah. It was a really memorable experience. And I took lots of photographs of the peeling paint of <laughs> her Blue House. And from those photographs, I went on to do some cyanotype printing, for, which took which was part and formed part of my MA work and my right. research for some of my garments that I made. So I think you can get inspiration from so many different places. And I think you just have to be open to observe and open to looking at the environment around you. So it doesn't necessarily have to be people who inspire. It can be things and places and emotions and smells and things as well. And I think if you're a textile artist and working in the world that we do, it's important to record those observations and carry a camera or a sketchbook around with you. So yes. that you can just make a note of something, a name, an exhibition title, take a quick snap of something from perhaps an unusual angle, and that can come back and feature in your work at a later date. You never know when something might make that connection or inspire you um, later on down the road. Yeah, that, that's, that's very true because... I certainly find that if you have to suddenly think about, right, I need to think of this title or this theme or something, it's, mm. you know, your brain goes blank. But it's, for me, I think things percolate. I, I, if, if, I, if I try not to think about something, then in the back of my head, it will be thinking about it. And then I kind of come back to it and think, right, what, what have I thought about? And then I can start to 
put some ideas down on a piece of paper and you mm. know and start to come out with a design or some thoughts or th- oh, yeah I've got some photos about that and you kind of dig them out don't you so that's yeah. how I kind of go around in a bit of a percolating circle I would say when I'm trying to come up with some things but I have to say at the moment I'm a bit of a so-and-so for percolates on there I think oh yes that's my idea right that's it then because if I haven't really got much more kind of time to sit and think about this anymore so I'll kind of pick pick something and then go and start start with it but there again I'm doing you know mine's just a kind of a background background hobby really so but I think when you look back over bodies of work that you've produced over the years you can see common connections obviously Mm -hmm. there's themes that are more important to you that do reoccur in your work perhaps in different ways in more mature ways um, sometimes a feature might be quite dominant a few years ago and then it's more subtle today so I think it's a process isn't it it's that learning yes. observing, continuing refining and becoming more observant and looking I mean we're all still learning and I love learning mm. and each piece of work that I make whoever it might be inspired by or whatever my ideas have have progressed from I think every piece of work that I make for an exhibition you learn from and you continue to grow through that process which is really fascinating yes and anything that we do it's brilliant to just keep on learning and trying and I just say when you track back how you've developed and things and sometimes you maybe even don't realize that you have until you go back and look and think, oh, yeah, look how, yeah. how different that is now. Wow. And in that kind of self-reflection, I think, is a very important process. It is, and I, I quite often say that to my students. You've got to look sometimes not where you've still got to go, but how far you've come. Yes, and it's a journey. Self-reflection is very, very important. Yes, yes. So you've mentioned a couple of ideas, and particularly this influence of textiles and fashion and dressmaking on your work what would you say are your favorite techniques Julia you know, why do you like them so much and and again have they changed over the time that you've been experimenting and, and developing your art yes I think things do change from time to time and I think going back to inspiration you get influenced from different people or different things at different times Mm. I spent some time working in a multicultural arts group where I was the arts development officer in the west end of Newcastle quite some time ago (laughs) and we had a lot of multicultural students there and I learned a lot of ethnic embroidery techniques from them and as a consequence I really wanted to go to India so I did some traveling in India and I got very influenced by the Banjara textiles from India yes Banjara people use very large mirrors and there was a time and still to some extent I do from time to time use the shisha mirrors and that reference in my own work I really enjoyed that I love the rhythm of the running stitch just by hand which the Banjara tribe use ever so much in their works Mm. not quite in a pattern darning sense but some of the stitches are threaded and I love the simplicity of the running stitch because I think you can use that in so many ways yes I think my passion has to be and I still come back to machine embroidering Mm. I find it so therapeutic sitting down at the machine I think the freedom to express yourself and to draw with the needle is so enjoyable I could sit for hours and hours and hours stitching and I'm very interested in the memories of in cloth so a lot of the raw materials that I work with or predominantly all the raw materials that I work with are upcycled second-hand uniforms old school um, clothes uniforms yeah. uh, jeans I'm interested in the phrase along the bottoms of trousers, like jeans. All oh, right, yes. That the wearers might leave stains in tablecloths. I do a lot of work with underwear as well and vintage lace. And I think that my favourite techniques revolve around using those landmarks and finding out how I can piece those together in different assemblages or layer them in different ways to show off some of those original marks. So sometimes my piecing together is stitched so carefully that, that you can't actually see my mark as a maker particularly. Right. You can in a composition, yeah. or I might find a little bit of an edge or add the button or fray some stitching. But quite a lot of my compositions, 
are minimally embroidered but they're constructed so that you can see the wear and tear and the marks of the previous owner or the user or the wearer. Now that's an interesting idea because quite often we're trying to obliterate those marks aren't we? Let's get the purcell and the vanish out and get rid of those yeah. um, those, those mud stains and that, that yeah. wine that was spilt on the tablecloth and caused the big argument etc etc. So that's going the opposite way isn't it? Let's mm. celebrate what happened with that wine stain or okay. you know, what's happened with the jeans. So that's, that's an interesting idea and I'm sure I came across something you know with, with jeans with the double seam on the outside it wears in different places and it's almost like a unique barcode of somebody how they've worn their jeans and I read somewhere that they're all very unique yes yes and even if you do iron your clothes you still can't iron out some of those creases very easily from your trousers because they have formed around the shape of your Mm -hmm. body and how you might have pulled your trousers up when you sit down or keep crossing your legs in a particular way the folds in the denim creates lovely lovely marks across the surface and that's what I'm quite interested in expressing and taking forward and a lot of my work that involves the denim actually highlights those marks Mm. so yes I would say that they're some of my favorite techniques to explore and exploit the memories in cloth and those those marks now so you must be a bit of a fiend around the charity shops then are you well, actually, I get a lot of my materials donated. Ah. My children grow out of their clothes. So I've yes. got all their old school uniforms. Oh, yes. I have included even parts of their shoes and things like that in my work before. Oh. And a lot of the underwear that I use has been donated. And I think that my work around the underwear has been, it expresses and makes a social comment on who we are as women. So it makes a feminist statement. So it's important to me that the underwear has been worn because it has the mark of that wearer. And the stories that come in with the underwear are very, very personal. So it's important that the stories are related to the textiles that have been used who uh, come from that, that person, that woman. Yes. So again, the textiles are telling are telling those stories in a different way aren't they so they are yes obviously like all of us I'd like going around charity shops looking for bargains and lovely um perhaps some hideous clothing actually (laughs) 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 and recycled or upcycled into new pieces yeah it's a shame jumble sales vanished really isn't it I used to love jumble yes, sales I used to love going around jumble sales yeah, far, yeah. teenage years you could get all sorts there and say I was always you know get this jacket oh I'll try and do something with it and you were always fiddling around with various things to um, come up with something different to wear yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> and I can remember going around charity shops and flea markets and jumble sales even asking for a student discount which <laughs> 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 student days when I was quite penniless <laughs> uh, well you see my mum used to um, she used to run the, the village hall in the, the village where we were so she would be organizing the jumbo so so we got mm. roped in to help so yeah. it was there was always piles of stuff left anyway you know so it, it, then then it went on to the um, rag shredder people you know that make yeah. roofs and stuff so really it was just like well whatever's left just have a rummage through yourself or if there was anything really tasty that you wanted at the start you know well I'll put 50p in the pot or 10p yeah. or whatever it was in them days so yes you saw the rares before the crowds really <laughs> yes <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well moving on from jumbo mm-hmm. so now you mentioned in your bio there about being your work being filmed in various ways and also being uh, you're having your hour on the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square. Mm. So I'm sure that must be one of your high points of your textile art and embroidery journey so far. So would you like to share anything about that and also any other highlights um, with us, Julia? Yeah, so um, the hour on the fourth plinth was something that you could apply for. Any member of the public could apply for one hour on the fourth plinth. And it was an amazing project. Mm. The fourth plinth, as many people will know, does not have a permanent statue on it. And there was a tender that went out to different artists. And Anthony Gormley won that tender. And his idea was to have one person on the plinth for one hour over for the whole 24 hours in the day for 100 days. Mm. And you could apply for that. So over the course of his project, 2,400 people stood on the fourth plinth. 
doing what they wanted. Obviously, you had to sign a contract to say that you weren't going to be up there naked mm-hmm. or explosives up there or what have you. And I think was, some people actually did do that. Um, but my idea was to exhibit my artwork and talk about what I did on yes. the fourth plant. And previously to that, I had been making with underwear um, knicker bunting installations and I had made three bra dresses. And the bra dresses came to fruition when I was working on an exhibition with the theme of identity with the local group called Fusion in the Northeast. Yeah. A big exhibition at Hartley Paul, and the title of that was Identity. And I wanted to work with some new materials, materials that I hadn't worked with before. I wanted to express myself as a woman. I wanted to make a feminist and social comment, like I said before, on who we are as women in society. And I started working with underwear. The underwear came in from students, friends, colleagues, neighbours, everybody else who wanted to send in some underwear did so. And I was absolutely inundated <laughs> and bras and thongs and camisoles and all sorts of things. And I realised very quickly that the power of the work and the quantity of the donations and the stories that came in with the pieces was far too much to work for just one exhibition. Right, yes. So I did include all the knickers in the first knicker bunting installation in the identity exhibition. And that made 100 metres of knicker bunting. Oh, that's... That, yeah, that was entitled Push My Button, that first installation. And I have continued since then, in the last few years, to go up and down the country making knicker bunting with women groups. And that oh, is definitely a highlight to me because I think when you're, working with people, when you're working with people's underwear, you're working with something as a textile that has been very close to the body, very intimately worn. And... I wanted to show with the knickers and the bras that our underwear is stained, it is baggy, it's not always fancy, it's not always frilly, it's practical, Mm -hmm. it's not always sexy. It is what we we wear that because that's who we are as women. And we aren't always wearing this sexy lingerie that the media (laughs) thinks that we should wear because it's not practical all the time, it's not comfortable. It might be pretty on a model, but it doesn't work on all of our bodies Mm -hmm. In shapes and sizes who we are as women so that was the ethics and the ethos behind my work and I made three bra dresses and the stories that came in with those were really quite moving and poignant one of my friends sent in a white bra and she said I can't wear this any longer because I have breast cancer and I have to change the style of the bra that I can wear yes and it there was other stories about breast cancer so when yes. I had an opportunity to go on the fourth plinth I thought I would make my fourth bra dress in pink bras to go and wear on the fourth brilliant plinth. so I had I can't remember how many now I think it was about 200 300 bras and I included every bra that came in to the project yeah uh, there was no two bras the same amazingly yeah. wow and a lot of celebrities supported the project because I was raising money for breakthrough breast cancer. Yes. And and wearing this on a fourth plinth. It was incredibly heavy. Yes. But I was also telling the stories of the women who wore these bras on an everyday basis and also telling their stories, some of which related to cancer. Mm. And so that was the bra ra dress that I wore on the fourth plinth. So it was a very unique project of Anthony Gormley's to be involved in. Yes. It was a one-off piece of work. It did raise money for Breakthrough Breast Cancer, which is a charity that I, is my favourite charity that I support. Yeah. So that's definitely been one of the highlights. Wow. Well, I'm not surprised. That was just and, um, and very ingenious as well, using using the bras and the stories yeah. and so on. So yeah, that been, stood out as being quite quite different as well. Yeah, thank you. It was, it was really a, a memorable occasion. And I know that embroidery has its, um, the contact that goes around to Embroiderers Guild members. Yes me on the fourth plinth on the front of that which has always been a lovely thing to have treasured fab but yes but other other highlights have included getting a distinction for my ma in contemporary applied arts it's great to have published two popular batswood titles that i mm. co-wrote with rachel a friend of mine yeah and um more recently or well, in the last three years i've been selected to be a member of the textile study group so it's been really 
great to work alongside some very well-known textile artists who, like me, exhibit and teach nationally and internationally. Yes. And to continue my learning, to learn alongside others. At the Textile Study Group, we have two weekends a year where we get together and we have an outside tutor so we can continue our learning and mm. challenge ourselves and question each other. And our work is continually reviewed. We have to have a review every three to five years. Right. And that is quite good because it keeps us on our toes, keeps us moving yeah. forward, yes. and keeps the group more in a more dynamic way than if we were all just sitting there thinking, oh, we've made it. Because mm-hmm. like I was saying before, you have to continue pushing yourself. You, you have to continue exploring new avenues, whether that's learning or through teaching or observing others and working alongside um, others in exhibitions. So. Yeah, I think, it, as you say, it keeps it dynamic, doesn't it, really? Mm. Meeting together like that and sparking off each other as well and yeah. spark, sparking ideas and, and having that external stimulus, I think, is very important to mm-hmm. us all as well. Well, yeah. well, they're absolutely really lovely highlights. Very, yeah. very good and um, very interesting as well for us all. So thank you for sharing those with us, Julia. Yeah. That's been brilliant. So now moving on from highlights to, do you have any stories that we might want to have a bit of a giggle about mm-hmm. when something possibly didn't go quite as planned and, well, a disaster is a bit strong, but was possibly a bit of a disaster? And really, what did you learn from that experience, which is the most important thing to share with us? Mm, I think all of us have had some disasters <laughs> in textiles from time to time, <laughs> things that haven't gone according to plan, deadlines that have crept up on us a little bit too quickly. So. I think that I haven't really had major disasters. I think I've been able to rescue or overcome problems. I think the most embarrassing or the hardest ones to have dealt with are the technical problems when you're up on a platform or giving a talk to somebody, or not to somebody, to a whole group of people, a guild, a regional day, and sometimes you might have 30 people in front of you or 200 people, and you have a technical failure. I've been in a situation where my computer has frozen <laughs> and points, um, bulbs have blown in projectors. Oh, yes. So those things that you just cannot foresee, you can prepare for them. And the first time I think it happened, I was absolutely petrified. I got very hot. <laughs> <laughs> stressed. <laughs> my cheeks, very stressed. Um, but now, even it happened to me last week, actually, again, when my computer froze in when I was about 80% of the way through my presentation to yes. across in Carlisle. It was a quilters group, the Weavers quilters. We were a lovely group of women. But the last few slides were about my work. Unfortunately, I had those pieces with me so I could show them uh, to the group yes. in person. And I think what I've learned from it is not to get too flustered. Accidents, technical hitches problems disasters happen to us all we're all human and I think mostly if you can just own the moment and sometimes anticipate it but get over it as calmly as you can most people are very very supportive in that situation and understand what it's like and I think some of the hard times have come when I've been a, a single parent a couple of times in my life and I think sometimes when my children have been ill and I've had to it's been hard to try and find someone to look after them when I had to go to work. Yeah. And it's the hardest times I've been trying to meet lots of demands and juggle so many commitments, meet deadlines and run a business as a single parent. So there have been hitches over the years, but nothing that has been um, so awful that I've wanted to go <laughs> and never come out again or whatever. I think most of the times have been situations where like I say people have been very supportive and understanding and you learn from those and not to get flustered and to think like I said before we are all human and everybody can help you out of the situation really. Brilliant you raise a very important point there that people are actually very forgiving of things like that Mm. it takes a very miserable person to kind of sit there moaning about what's you know this is broken or that's broken well hey ho it happens you know I used to do a lot of technical training in my previous life and Mm. yes you know you'd be there delivering a course for something and the 
damn stupid protection wouldn't work anymore or bulbs yeah. blew and no, oh, there was always something and you just kind of smile and say okay let's just have a break let's see what we can do about fixing this if not I've got plan b we'll manage let's you know let's go I um, think yeah that's right and I think as a public speaker you are putting yourself out there all the time so I think you have to have an air of confidence and if anything goes wrong you can overcome it quite easily I think because of the, uh, the experience that you build up in, by being in that situation and I think if you don't get flustered about these things um, it helps you continue doesn't it <laughs> get really, really stressed, yeah it? yes it does and it's easy to say don't get stressed and we all do but I think as as we develop experience then we do realize that actually is not going to do us any good mm. and the world isn't going to end and mm. actually we're talking about textiles or our work or something we're not saving a life here you know it's we haven't got somebody in the operating theater under our knife we're mm. fine things can carry on so yeah that's mm. a very good attitude to have there so thank mm. you for that one now well, you mentioned before about deadlines creeping up mm. and obviously you've got a lot of projects on the go so have you heard of the saying beware of long distant elephants so those items that seem so very far away when you agree to do them but slowly they creep up and suddenly there they are looming large the deadline is nearly with you how do you manage all of your distant elephants Julia how do you Mm -hmm. keep track of your projects keep self-organized but keep that creative process flowing I think it's quite difficult to do that sometimes. <laughs> I think it is. <laughs> it is, isn't it? I do have very good time management skills. And I think when you are managing so many different projects, teaching, writing, uh, traveling up and down the country to teach different workshops, managing mm-hmm. online students, on-site students, and so on, I think you have to have good organizational skills. I think I spend a lot of time working at home. A lot of my time at the moment is based on admin, like I said before, when yes you know, updating handouts, online tutorials, and so on. And I think you have to be quite motivated. But I do have a passion about what I do. And I think the business degree that I did does help me organize my time. It helps me organize the components of my business. Um, But I think generally, for when I'm creating work for exhibitions, I think I work better when I'm under, well, as the deadline gets closer, actually. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know that it's looming, but when it gets closer, I think it focuses you a little bit more. Yes, that can and it was. I think it was actually Julia Caprara who said to me a long time ago that you have to make the most of your 10 minutes. All of those 10 minutes add up to a bigger <laughs> whole. Yes. Because when my children were little and I was a single parent, I had to be around for school times, bedtimes. They were quite young and they were wanting my attention quite rightly. And I didn't ever have a whole day that I could put aside or half an afternoon or something that I could put aside to work on. So Julia, when she was mentoring me, said, make the most of your 10 minutes. And I thought, yeah, that is very true. If I can grab 10 minutes here and 10 minutes there, those 10 minutes gradually add up to an hour. The hours add up to half an afternoon in the day and so on. So that's how the attitude that I've had to towards work really but I think it's really important to balance your creative time and your busy time with some headspace outside of work I really like going out for walks I go on my bike up to the moors I go out for runs occasionally and I think it's important to build that headspace Mm. time into a routine and a structure so that you can go out and process you're not just all the time at your sewing machine or your computer yes I think it's really important to get out to exercise to stretch to think and process things in a different way oh well I could have written that because that's exactly how I go about things the way I earn money is via the internet Mm. delivering online services for people and yeah I like to be outside I I get up early and go running along the seafront Mm. I am a single mum so it's the same thing the same same kind of challenges juggling everybody and everything Mm. but it is those 10 minutes because quite often I'm involved with mentoring kind of new virtual assistants and so on as well and people have this idea of oh well if only I can get a whole afternoon then I can do dot 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 Mm. and that is something that it just doesn't happen but if you make use of those 10 minutes those five minutes that half an hour it is surprising with a bit of focus what you can actually get done and oh all of a sudden that big task has been achieved but people still insist on trying to well I'm going to block out all of next week or I'm going to block out all of Monday it 
it, it never happens, does it? So that's I think right. it's very, and very if, important to highlight those small units of time, very valuable. That's right. And I think sometimes even if you are lucky enough to block out a time, you sit down and you cannot force creativity. No. Sometimes get to sit, sit down because you have the time, but you haven't got the ideas mm. or you haven't got the motivation to get out your sewing machine. So it doesn't always work like that. When no, no, I've done that enough times. It's like, oh, right, my, my son's my son's away for the weekend. Woohoo, whoopee, I'm going to get loads of sewing done. Yeah. And then I, no, I can't think what to do or I'm, I'm stuck on something. Or, and then I go and do gardening mm. or I go out and it's like, mm. oh, did you do any sewing? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear, <laughs> never mind. It's all set. That's right. Yeah. No. So, as we're talking about plans there, what future plans and projects and ideas would you like to share with us that you've got coming up, you know, in the next kind of few months or so, Julia? Mm-hmm. Um, I think I've got a couple of my own workshops coming up quite soon and I shall be doing some teaching on the learning curve at the Knitting and Stitching Show at Harrogate in November. Oh, are you going to be there on Sunday? No, unfortunately <laughs> not this year. I'm going to be there Thursday, Friday, Saturday this year. Oh, I'm going on Sunday. Damn, I could have come and said hello. <laughs> no, not this year. Um, I'm still working on sitting guilds courses with Tracy at Stitch yeah. Business, but because those have come to close, we're just teaching out those courses, but we're yes. looking to create some new courses, new ideas for continuing working with students across yes. the world. I still would like to do some further study and more travel um, mm-hmm. myself. I think my learning is continuing and I think that's important for my practice. I'm going to be teaching in Australia and New Zealand. So I'm going to be away for the month of April next year, which is something that's quite exciting to look forward to. And I'm also looking forward to the touring exhibition of Disrupt, which I mentioned before. Oh, yes. The two pieces that I've got in that exhibition, one is entitled To No Avail, and one is an interactive piece called Divorce Discourse. Mm. And our exhibition is opening in Oldham on the 2nd of December this year and finishes in February in 2018. And in 2018, it's also touring to Minerva Arts Centre in Landidlows, Wales mm. and going up to, and that will be in April to May and then yes. it's going to go in Peebles south of Edinburgh in June and July next year so that's really exciting that yes an exhibition issue-based work from all of us in the textile study group will be touring the country so that will be exciting to look forward to as well well that's that's a, a, another nice list of things for us all to keep an eye out for you then absolutely mm. yeah <laughs> Well, Julia, thank you so much for sharing your stitchery story with us today. I'm sure we could have talked for another three hours, um, but it's been absolutely fascinating finding out your highlights and what inspires you and all about your art. So I'm sure everybody listening would absolutely love to find out more about your work. Now, I have included a lot of the the, all of the links that you've sent me because you're everywhere um mm-hmm. but the kind of main areas that you would like people to find you what would those be yes i'm julia tristan textiles on facebook yeah and i probably update that more than i update my website yes my website has got all my contact links on and details of the talks that i do and my website has my profile and artist statement things like that but it does need a little bit of an update right it's hard to keep on top of your own things yeah. yes do tell me about it <laughs> i am on twitter and yeah other social media but uh, yeah you can find me through my website and my contact pages and probably the links too that you put up yes uh, absolutely videos. perfect so, so everybody go and find out all about what julia is up to yeah, because and it's I send, very interesting thank you and i send out a newsletter a couple of times a year so if people want to sign up to my newsletter and see what i'm doing and running my own workshops they can do that by emailing me brilliant Okay, that's absolutely great. So thank you so much, Julia. It's been absolutely wonderful speaking to you. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I could have carried on for hours, but um, here we are at 40 odd minutes. So, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Sue. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, Julia. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Bye. If you like this episode and want to hear more, then please join the Stitch Me Stories fan club so you can get an email when a new episode is released. It's a quick and easy way of listening and of keeping up with any news and offers from our lovely guests. Please visit stitcherystories.com to join the fan club. Of course, if you have iTunes, then subscribe there to automatically get new episodes. And why not leave us a review and rating whilst you are there? So that is the end of our Stitchery Story for today. 
So keep stitching, keep smiling and keep creating your very own stitcher with stars. <laughs>